This is Germany in the 1920s. The First World War has been lost, and also a vast empire. Turmoil rules a people who have always had a strong ruler and are adrift in the first democracy they have ever known. Their discarded ruler, Kaiser Wilhelm II, in exile in Holland, cannot help them. He feeds his ducks and lets it be known that his days of heroic gestures are past. But heroics are not past for one Austrian immigrant, Adolf Hitler, who has a party and a plan to end the turmoil and in so doing, end Germany's republic and the world's peace. In a moment, this story from Kaiser to Führer. As World War I grinds to a close in November 1918, war-weary Germany is dissolving into near anarchy. Strikes to end the war unexpectedly end the monarchy too, and a republic is proclaimed. The new government is unprepared for responsibility. Civil war breaks out as demobilized servicemen and civilians join the radical Spartacist movement which tries to emulate Bolshevik Russia's example. Private armies spring up as the weak caretaker government asks protection from the old high command which recruits volunteers to put down the communist riots. The Spartacists defeated, delegates come to the city of Weimar to organize a permanent republic. Such power is strange to Germans. They act, says one observer, like timid clerks called trembling into the main office. The new government is already beholden to the general staff for help in the Civil War. Under its assembly appointed first president, Social Democrat Friedrich Ebert, Germany finds the outward form of democracy. Irreconcilable forces work to destroy the uncertain republic. The leftists, especially the communists, continue to foment unrest. Political strikes are called and are bloodily put down. The average German is no world revolutionist, but jobs are few, inflation is growing, and the punishing Versailles Treaty is draining Germany economically. Now the right-wing extremists see their opportunity to undermine the young republic. In 1920, militarists led by Wolfgang Kopp seized power in Berlin and forced the weak government to flee. Only a nationwide strike causes the cop putsch to collapse after four days. But the government, fearing the communists more, continues to make common cause with the generals. In 1923, Germany is invaded by the French and Belgians. They claim she has delayed reparations payments and they occupy her industrial heart, the Ruhr Valley. The occupiers impose an economic blockade. It practically severs from Germany not only the Ruhr, but much of the industrial Rhineland which is held by the British and other allied forces. Chaos results, with German production curtailed, commercial activity at a standstill, inflation runs wild. One billion marks for a loaf of bread. Workers' wages can't keep up with the daily rise in prices. 49,000 marks to the dollar, then 100,000. 200 million marks to the dollar, four trillion. The mint works round the clock to print and overprint paper money.
120 billion marks for a piece of herring. 300 billion marks for a half pound of apples. The inflation wipes out the middle class, which relies on fixed salaries and bank savings. There are times, records a writer, when I want to scream aloud and run away from the pictures of horror which haunt me like hallucinations. Not everyone suffers. Speculators in real estate grow rich. And big industrialists pay off old loans, buy equipment, and expand. Only goods have any real value. What money you have, you spend before it's worthless. Everything's for sale. The tragedy of Germany's inflation breeds many extremist parties which try to give answers to its sufferers. German Workers' Party, the Nazis, who blame the Republic, the Allies, and the Jews for everything. Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, who has watched his party expand from a handful to thousands, calls for action. On November 8, 1923, in this Munich beer hall, he proclaims a national revolution. He's arrested and sent to Landsberg prison for five years. History will someday laughingly tear up this verdict, he predicts. He's right. He's freed in nine months, just long enough to write a blueprint for conquest, Mein Kampf. Germany is hungry for leadership and disheartened by democracy. Then, after a succession of weak chancellors, comes forceful Gustav Stresemann, a conservative who supports the Republic. His one aim is to stabilize the currency and the inflation. Stresemann succeeds with strong measures reinforced by the Dawes plan of foreign assistance named for its prime mover, American financier Charles Dawes. The Republic is reprieved. Upon the death of President Ebert in 1925, the nation again shows its disunity and its fears of freedom in an election campaign to choose its next president. Over half a dozen political parties appeal to the public with promises and threats. For the first time in history, Germans go to the polls to elect a president. Expressing the deep-seated feelings of a people who worship duty and power above all, they choose 77-year-old Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, an honored memory from the imperial past. The national rifts are soon concealed by Germany's phenomenal recovery from the inflation. The Allies evacuate her industrial areas and production boom. Rezeman, now foreign minister, ushers her into the League of Nations and fosters friendship with her former enemies who become her best customers. And so it seems that the smoke from her industry has forever blotted out Germany's past history and problems, just as her much heralded accomplishments, such as the Graf Zeppelin, are making the world forget her past. In the middle and late 1920s, Germany symbolizes peaceful progress. 
Perhaps her military budget seems over large for so small an army, and there are reports that military pilots are being trained by her commercial airline. But these are mere ripples on the wave of prosperity which carries lovely German liners like the Europa back and forth to America. In the flush of abundance, many skeptical Germans now admit that democracy and the republic aren't so bad after all. Listen to those who say the poor are as poor as ever, or say that this prosperity is a fool's paradise based on foreign loans. Let's go for a swim. On the surface, it is all froth and feathers. But there are some who see the truth and worry. The artists whose eyes are not glazed by the prosperity. They record the dissolute nightlife, the profiteers and the festering hatreds. So sees artist George Gross. And there are others who see beneath the surface. The ugliness, inhumanity, absurdity of people. Blank-eyed, open-headed, animal-like, ready to grab everything they can. Expressionist artists Vasily Kandinsky and Max Pechstein vividly depict two of the other side of the coin. And famed Katha Kalwitz records how many Germans still suffer and have little hope even in these prosperous times. A society with grave inequality, Germany nevertheless enjoys a cultural rebirth. Even the staid nationalistic universities feel the fresh breeze and belatedly recognize the Republic's existence. They confer honorary degrees on its officials, such as Foreign Minister Stresemann. Democratic Germany provides the free atmosphere for a novelist like Thomas Mann to write his masterpiece, The Magic Mountain. Other writers, Heinrich Mann, Arnold Schweig, Bertolt Brecht, and Emil Ludwig flourish here. And scientists such as Albert Einstein, these years see the fullest flowering of German art and science in generations. The German theater gives birth to director Max Reinhardt and to composer Kurt Weil. And the world's movie audiences applaud German films with Elizabeth Bergner, Emil Jannings, Conrad Veidt, and Marlena Dietrich. Such extravaganzas as Metropolis, with its warning of men become slaves to machines, stuns the world's public with their power. Cringing men are devoured by their master. Again, the artist sees what the German public fails or fears to foresee. A master for Germany is indeed waiting for his call. Maddeningly, for Adolf Hitler, it is being delayed by the prosperous times. But Hitler can still collect a crowd, for there are enough disgruntled people in Germany. What's more, he's something to see, an oddity. Disregard what he says, Berlin society exclaims. Just watch him. He has a style all his own. From brown 
shirts to the other end of the political rainbow. The Reds are waiting too for the prosperity to end. In the middle, there is the large mass of Germans who now want democracy to work. But the extremists keep the police busy. Contributions to the Nazi party fall so low that stormtroopers join soup lines. These are the followers of Hitler, waiting. Hold on, he urges them. Your time will come. Why disturb oneself over politics, say the well-heeled Germans, when there's tea dancing to enjoy? is a world built on sand, and now the world begins to crumble. It is 1929, Depression. and the prosperous middle class are faced again with economic disaster. By the end of 1929, Stresemann is dead, foreign loans and trade dwindle, and unemployment grows. All of Germany's maladies and latent passions come surface as the jobless count rises from two million to six million. In 1932, when Hindenburg comes up for re-election as president, the change in mood is apparent. His chief opponent is Adolf Hitler, has risen from ninth to second place. The communists, too, gain greatly, and this fact Hitler uses to obtain huge funds from the frightened industrialists. He mocks the republic and its confusion of squabbling parties. Die Herren Hausbesitzer müssen ihre besonderen Interessen politischer Art, weltanschaulicher Art, auch durch eine Partei vertreten lassen. Und die Herren Mieter natürlich können da nicht zurückbleiben. Und die Katholiken auch eine eigene Partei und die Protestanten eine Partei. Und die Bayern eine Partei und die Thüringer eine eigene Partei. Und die Württemberger noch eine besondere Spezialpartei. Und so weiter, 34 in einem Ländchen. In this crucial presidential campaign, and in deference to his industrial backers, Hitler drops his attacks on big business. He concentrates instead on the Jews, 
1% of the population whom he links with the communists and foreigners and blames for all of Germany's troubles. Every vote counts as the aged and the sick are brought to the polls in the battle between Hitler and Hindenburg. Hindenburg, ironically, is now supported by the parties who want to save democracy in Germany. During the voting and tabulating, there is bloodshed in the streets as Nazi stormtroopers, Hitler's private army, assault those who oppose them or support the Republic. But when the counting is over, Hindenburg wins, 19 million to 13 million. Hitler's anger rises. Determined as he is to rule, he refuses to risk revolution, remembering his Munich fiasco. What he now needs is a conspirator on the inside to help him. Hindenburg despises Hitler as an upstart, but 84 years old and failing, he is easily influenced by his military and industrial friends who are negotiating with Hitler, confident they can control the Nazis. Hindenburg will betray the trust of those who look to him to save the Republic. He will submit to a deal made by his favorite, ex-Chancellor Franz von Papen, precisely the arch-conspirator Hitler needs to ascend to power legally. January 30th, 1933. About to enter smiling, the new Vice-Chancellor, Franz von Papen. Greeting him, the beneficiary of the deal, Adolf Hitler, just appointed by President Hindenburg as the new German Chancellor. Nationalist leader Hugenberg indicates conservative distaste for Hitler. He'd rather not sit next to him. Nazi Hermann Goering sits cheek by jowl to Hitler. He knows where the power lies. That night, a Nazi victory parade for the Fuhrer and for the end of the 14-year-old Republic. The old president, soon to die, watches. The upstart has made it. Darkness has descended, casting its shadow on the world. It will be 12 bloody years before another dawn in Germany.